All right, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Friday. It's nice end of the week. Okay, so today we're going to continue talking about objects, and one of the topics I have to introduce today is one of the stickier conceptual bits that we're going to have to learn about objects this semester. So uh, bear with me. This is a um, a concept and a keyword that causes people a lot of problems, a lot of confusion, but I think that by introducing it and by making sure that you understand it, you actually are going to end up understanding something about objects that you wouldn't necessarily understand perfectly if you didn't understand static. So that's where we're gonna go. Okay, so I apologize for last time. The slide playground is up and running again. It should work fine today. Um, as a result of that, I'll slow down a few times today and we'll go over some examples more carefully because I know we didn't get to play with things last time. Um, but as a reminder um, for you, from this point forward, um, we're not going to run loose code or loose methods that are defined outside of a class. So all of our examples, like this one, are going to run, they're going to start execution in the main method defined as part of the example class. Okay? So if you don't call the class example, it's going to get angry. If you call the main method something else, it's going to get, it's going to fail. If you stick loose code in here, it's also not going to compile, okay? And again, this is more similar to how Java actually works. We are sort of taking away the training wheels that we used for the first month that allowed us to write imperative code more easily, because now we're dealing with objects, and at the end of today's lecture, you're actually going to understand pretty much everything there is to know about this uh, static main method, which is right now still a little bit mysterious. But when we run these examples, they start running in the main method that's defined on the example class. Um, the classes don't have to be in any uh, particular order, so we'll usually put example at the bottom, but we can put it, I think, let's find out. We can put it up here, too. Um, again, normally what we'll do is we'll uh, define classes that we're working with and we're experimenting with up at the top, and then we'll have our example class at the bottom, and the main method will contain any of the code that we want to run. Okay, awesome. So, um, first thing I want to say is you guys did uh, really well on the midterm. Congratulations. Give yourselves a little round of applause here. Um, that's actually a very good score. You know, and again, some of you are coming from places where it's like you got an 85 and you felt bad about yourself, but don't. Um, you know, this is a, a good number. It compares well with prior classes. So on Monday, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the midterm, and I'm going to kind of go through some of the questions with you, and we'll talk about how to interpret your score. Because again, this is almost entirely a diagnostic tool for you. It's not punishment. It's not something we do because we're angry with you. Um, it was something we did so that you can assess your own standing, your own progress in the course. Um, you know, for some of you, this, uh, the midterm result is going to indicate that, you know, things are going great. For some of you, you may need to tweak a couple of things. Uh, for other people, we're, we have some serious concerns. Um, and really what it has to do, and, and you know this already, so I'll, I'll say this right now so you can maybe start to chew on it over the weekend. What I care about on this exam more than anything else, is how you did on the programming questions. If you bombed most of the multiple choice, I'm a little confused by that, um, but, okay. If you did the programming questions, if you were able to do the programming questions, you were confident about those and you did well on those, and again, somehow you bombed the multiple choice questions, I'm still a little confused about how that, that's possible, but um, then I'm cool, you know? Um, if you were not able to do most of the programming problems on the midterm, I am concerned about your future in the class. Uh, because that's kind of the baseline that we're establishing that we're gonna build on as we go forward. So that's the kind of imperative code that you need to be able to write so that you can just work on some of the object-oriented concepts that are gonna come up over the next month. Okay, so again, we'll, go, we'll talk about this more on Monday, but overall I was, I was satisfied with the performance of the class. Um, any questions about Midterm exam, anything else up to this point? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is, will I release the programming questions for the midterm? The answer is yes. I need to double check and make sure everybody's taken it. Um, but assuming that's the case, probably next week, put them up there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we want you guys to practice. Um, okay, good. So, let's go back to Wednesday. So we've started to learn how to design our own types in the Java programming language. Up until this point, we've been working with these primitive types, but they're limited. They don't allow us to store very much information. So now, we're using one of Java's built-in features, which is a very clever idea. It said, look, we don't know about all the different kinds of data that people are gonna wanna work with in the future. So in addition to giving them some starting points, these building blocks, the primitive types, ints, longs, characters, we're also gonna give them an object system that allows them to create their own types that can represent other pieces of information, other data. That's really what objects are about. I really wanna draw this connection very strongly for you because I don't think it's made enough. Objects are about data. The object system in Java when you define a class, you're establishing a new kind of data that you can work with in your program. Again, in this case, I'm defining a person class that has a name and an age. That's sort of canonical, but we can do some examples later where you pick something that you want to work with in a program, and we'll do an example where we kind of design a class that brings together various pieces of information about that thing that you need to store in order to work with it as part of your program. All right, so. Last time, what we started, what we added to our classes, which are already themselves kind of exciting, was this ability to hide information, this ability to control access to various pieces of data that are part of our class. So up here, I have a class declaration for a person class. This is telling Java that I'm going to create a new type in the language called person that's gonna store, as its name suggests, information about a person. And here, what I've done, is, you know, classes, as a review, combine state and behavior, data and algorithms. So every instance of a class stores the data that you specify that it should, and it also provides methods that you can use to access that data and to do useful things with it. So here I've got a person class, and I've decided that my person is gonna have both a name and an age. Last time we introduced these public and private access modifiers. And those are Java keywords that allow me to restrict access to parts of my class. And I can apply those both to variables and also, if needed, to methods. The two we looked at are public and private. And those are probably the most useful. Um, so, um, so a public variable, so let's start with variables. A public variable can be accessed by anybody. Anybody can directly set or retrieve the value of that variable. And one of the things where we left off last time was one of the things I told you that's interesting that has evolved about the Java programming language is it's very, very uncommon to have a public variable as part of your class. Normally, we use a different pattern, but I'm showing you this just so you understand that it's there. If you want to, you can do this. I can also create private variables. Now again, a private variable doesn't mean that that variable's inaccessible, that wouldn't be very useful. Instead, what it means is that only the methods that you define that are part of the class, only the methods that you associate with that class can access that variable. And those methods can both read and write the value. So public, anybody can modify it, anybody can retrieve it. Private, only the methods you define on the class can modify or retrieve the value, okay? The function access modifiers, public and private, work very similarly. So when I apply the keywords to a method, what this means is that public, anybody can call it. Private, it can only be called by other methods on the same class. And these are, these are important, because here's the way to think about it. When you're designing a class, particularly when you're designing the methods that are part of a class, We'll talk more about interfaces in a couple of weeks. That's a kind of a neat topic that comes up naturally when we start to talk about objects. But one of the things you're doing is you're determining what other people can do with that class. If you mark a method as public, anybody can call it, and you should expect people to call it, 
If you mark a method as public, you will probably need to explain to other people how to use it. You might have to add some documentation. This is what Javadoc is for, right? So when you look at the documentation for, for example, the string class, what you're seeing is information that was generated by Javadoc from comments that are actually in the code. A private method, on the other hand, is very different. It can only be used by the class. So really, the only person who can use it, if you're designing the class, is you. You can call it from your other methods and stuff like that. But you don't have to worry about somebody using that method um, who didn't write your code, right? Maybe you and some friends are working on a, on a project together, and maybe you're gonna publish this as a library that other people can use. And if you mark the method as private, it's invisible to anyone outside of your group. So you guys can use it, but no one else can call it. And that means that a lot of times you don't have to provide documentation for it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's private, right? It's only something that's useful to you. All right. Java has two other access modifiers, and actually only one of them is visible. It's one of the things I don't like about Java, okay? So there's something called protected. Again, we will, I will cover these at some point when we talk about packages, which is the organizational concept for software that comes up in Java that we don't talk about yet. And then there's also, also something called package private. Um, what's confusing about Java, okay? Let me just, let me just point this out. Let's see, let me get to a playground here, okay? One of the things that's confusing about Java is that the default setting, so you might wonder what happens, let's, let me do a different, find a different example. Okay, here we go. So let's do public name string, all right? So now if I create a person, I have an, remember, I have a default constructor that doesn't set either of the fields. So what I'm expecting person.name to be is null. Hmm. Oh. I've got things backwards. So I've been writing a lot of Kotlin recently, and my course developers have been teasing me. They said, you're gonna start messing up in lecture because in Kotlin, the name and the type are reversed. So that was the first mistake I made because of that. But I'll try not to make more. All right, so let's set the name. And then let's print it again. Just make sure that this is working the way that we expect because we marked it as public. And so, there we go, okay, good. Now, if I don't mark this as, if I, if I omit the access modifier, it still works. The reason for this is that if you omit the access modifier, the default is something called package private. And in many ways, package private can fool you into thinking that it's public, because it works for you a lot of the same way. It's not the same as public. So if I gave this piece of code to somebody else, they would no longer be able to set the name. The only reason that main can set the name is because it's included as part of this package that we're working with, a group of classes that are bundled together. Okay, so just to make it a little bit more confusing, there's no explicit package private modifier. So there's nothing like package private, that doesn't exist, okay? Um, but if you omit the access modifier, that's what you get. Okay, great. So let's talk about getters and setters. So what I pointed out, and this is an interesting, okay, so this is an interesting example of the evolution of a programming language. All right, so Java comes out, oh man, when did Java come out? I'm gonna look this up, 80s. Cross fingers, right? The only thing I always remember about Java is that it came out one, like a few weeks after JavaScript, which is interesting. Anyway, Java comes out and it has this feature. It says, I can make variables public. And, you know, on some level, this seems like a useful thing. Anybody can modify the value of the variable. Okay, so I've got this access modifier for variables. Nobody uses this anymore. It is considered to be bad, and check style will yell at you, to mark any of your class instance variables as public. Instead, this is what we do. We create a private instance variable. So before I had a public int age, or a package private int age, Instead, I create a private variable called age, and I create two special functions with very, very, um, you know, uh, 
mechanical syntax. Like I said, there's a feature in IntelliJ where you can get it to generate this code for you. It's boilerplate. Sometimes people joke about Java, the Java programmers like being paid by the line of code, because a lot of the code they write is like really formulaic, right, like this, okay? So you can imagine, I could write a piece of code to write this code, that's what IntelliJ did, okay? So I've got a private variable, then I've got two functions. I have a function called set age, and a function called get age. This is a setter and a getter. Set age takes an argument that's the same type as the variable, in this case an int, and it sets the variable to whatever you pass. So this is how you modify the variable. Get age returns the same type as the variable, takes no arguments, and just returns the value of the variable. So notice here that my variable is private. These functions are public. So essentially what I've done is rather than allowing anybody to set the value of age directly, instead, I'm forcing them to call these functions, set age and get age. And again, this has become so canonical in the Java community, this is how everybody does things, right? Um, and some of the languages that have appeared after Java that are Java-like will, will actually do this for you, okay? So this, so essentially we never mark variables public anymore. Now here it seems like, you know, again, I'm a Java programmer and I'm being paid by the line of code, I like this. Because before I had one line of code. Public int age. Now I've got seven. So I've multiplied my, my payout by seven. But there, why am I doing this? So right now, this accomplishes nothing. Okay, it's equivalent to just having a public variable. But what can I do now that I couldn't do before? It turns out, this is one of the, so this is interesting, right? It's kind of a fun observation. This design pattern unlocks all sorts of cool stuff. I have just really sort of dramatically changed the semantics of what I can do with my variables as part of my class. I've got a bunch of new stuff that I can do now. So give me an example. So again, right now, what I have is equivalent to having a public variable, but there's all sorts of new things I can do here. Now give me an example of one of these. What can I do? Some new things. Someone who hasn't contributed yet today. Yeah. Yeah, so every time you set the age, you're running code that I wrote. So I could take my setter, for example, and I could validate that the age that you passed is something that actually works as an age. Right? A negative age doesn't make sense, so maybe if you pass me a negative age, I'm gonna do something about that. Maybe I won't change the age, because I figure you set, you set an invalid value. Later in the semester, when we talk about exceptions, we'll have some things that we can do that'll cause the person who made this mistake to realize their error, okay? What else can I do? So I can validate my inputs, that's good, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I could do some auditing. So for example, let's say I wanna keep track of how many times the age of a person has changed. Right, I could do that, I could stick code in there to do that. I create a counter that's associated with it, and every time that function is called, I increment the counter. So I can, I can actually create a read, so it's, it's sort of interesting, right? Java has public and private. Public, anybody can modify it or retrieve it. Private, nobody can modify or to retrieve it. What if I want to have a read-only variable that is set in the constructor, but then is never modified? How would I do that here? I can accomplish that with this pattern. Let's say I want to have a variable that you can only read, but never write. What's that? Only write a getter. I don't have to provide a setter. If I take away the setter, you cannot change the value of the variable. All you can do is retrieve it. And there are times in which that's really useful, okay? So by using this design pattern, 
And I know this code got small, and we'll, uh, we'll look at it together. I can do all sorts of, all sorts of things, right? So, so here's another example, right? Here's an example where a single setter is being used, but then I have multiple getters to retrieve pieces of information that I can kind of, uh, extract from that one variable. So here's a person that has both a name, a first name and a last name. And I know, you know, I used to, you know, when you deal with data from a course, you realize that you guys have all sorts of weird names. Some of you only have one name, some have four, right? Some have, like, weird parts hanging on to the name that I don't understand. But let's pretend for now that dividing your name is as simple as finding a white space and splitting it into two parts, first name and last name. I know that this is not true, okay? But we're just gonna say this for now. So now look at my setter. When you modify the name, I actually changed three variables that are part of the class. I changed the name, the name just gets passed to, changed to whatever you pass. But I also do some work, right? I have some code in here. I split the name along the first white space, and I take the first part of that, say that's your first name, and the second part of that is your last name. So here's another, here's an example where essentially now I have three variables that are part of the class that I can retrieve. I can get the name, I can get the first name, and I can get the last name, but I can only set the name. When I set the name, those other variables are automatically populated. So let's, um, let's look at an example of this, okay? So let's design a class together that we're gonna use to store a certain number of integers, okay? So I have my storage class that I've created, and I've gotten us started by saying, okay, well, I know that I need to store a certain number of integers, so I'm gonna create, um, I'm gonna declare as part of my class that every instance of this class has a variable that's an array. That's where I'm gonna store the integers that you provide, okay? And then I'm gonna provide a get and a set method that's gonna allow you to modify the integers that are stored in this, uh, this storage class. Now, you might think, why am I doing this? This is like kind of really similar to an array. And it is, that's okay. But we can add a few things to it, okay. What's the first thing I need to do here? Okay, so this is our, this is our class design exercise for the day. What's the first thing I need to do? Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I need a constructor. And actually, that's a great point. I could do this a couple of different ways. I could have a constructor that takes an array and sets my array to that array and, and populates it with those values. I could do that. What about something simpler, though? I definitely want a constructor, right? At minimum, what does this, uh, constructor need to know about this class when it's created? The number of elements I'm gonna store. Okay, so let's create that constructor, right? Remember, when we create a constructor, we name it after the class, and I'm gonna take a variable called size. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that to say storage is equal to new int size. Okay, what can go wrong here? Yeah, what happens if size is a negative number? So I, I can already uh, kind of crash, crash my code here, which is not good. So let's say storage is equal to new storage. Okay, so first of all, obviously, I can't do this anymore. Um, notice this because I've created a constructor. I can't use the empty constructor, which is good. Okay, let's make sure it works with a value that uh, makes sense. Now let's try to pass a bad value, and now I've got this runtime error that's been created. Negative array size exception. Not good. Okay, so what can I do about this? I can solve this problem. Again, you guys don't have enough tools to solve this problem correctly. We will come back in like a month, and I'll put a new tool into your toolbox, and then we'll know what the right thing is to do. The problem is the constructor can't fail yet. But what can I do? Let's say you pass me a negative uh, number. What can I do to kind of work around this? 
Yeah, so I can check to see if the size is less than zero, okay? And if the size is less than zero, what should I do? I don't know, there's, there's, there's several options here. Someone suggest something. I definitely don't want to create the array with a negative size. That's not working. Yeah. I could print an error message. Yeah, I could do that, but I have to return. Here's the problem with constructors. I have to return a value. So what could I do? Yeah. Yeah, I could create an empty storage object. That seems reasonable. I mean, you messed up here. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you an empty storage object, which is super unuseful. And I'm also gonna print that error message, because I like that idea. I'm gonna tell you, let's do this. Let's say system.error, so you can also print, if I print to system.error, um, and then I'll print the size value that you, there we go, okay. So now at least it didn't crash. Okay, that's good. Again, this is not the right thing to do. It's not terrible, um, but it's not really the right thing to do, right? Keep in mind, too, um, when we work on code together in the playground, these error messages are kind of useful. But when you're, like, working on your Android app, if you call system.out.println, where does that go? Does anyone know? It goes into the output logs for your app. Do you know who doesn't read those? The user. Yeah. Like, there, there are other ways to communicate with the user, but uh, writing to the output is not going to be seen by anyone. But this is good for us. Okay. All right, good. So let's do that for now. Um, all right, so now if I wanted to store four integers, I can uh, do this. So, okay. Now what do I need? This class isn't very interesting yet. I need some, I need to add some methods. What would I like to do here? So I've created an array, it's empty initially. Ideally, I'd like to be able to do what with this, right? I mean, I was kind of making something that acted a little bit like an array. I can kind of make it like a safer version of an array. What do I need? Again, this is not super exciting yet. What do I need? What, what, what would I like to be able to do with this? Yeah. Is that? Well, let's, how about, like, get an element from the array? If I get the array, then this is acting a lot like, just like an array, right? But yeah, let, okay, so let's write, let's write a, uh, Let's write a method here. Um, so it's going to return an int. Oop. Oop. Okay. So I'm going to write a get. This is sort of a getter, although it's a little more complicated than the getters that we've seen so far. Let's say I want to ret retrieve a particular value from the array. So what I need to know is I need to know what the index is. So let's say get int index, and then we'll say return storage index, okay? So that's gonna work. First dot get zero. Oop, let's print that value. Okay. Who, who, who knows what this is gonna print? What's the default? So I never, I haven't set any of the values in the array yet. The default value, if an array isn't initialized for ints, is, ooh, so the array value would be no, but I set the array. What's inside the array? Ints, and what's the default value for an int? Zero, yeah, you're close. If I hadn't initialized the array in the constructor, you'd be right. Yeah, all right, zero, good, okay? So now let's do something, okay, so now I've got a problem. I can stick a negative value in here, this is not good. Okay, so I would like to avoid this problem. So what can I do? Remember, this is like a, I'm trying to make this like a safer version of an array, meaning that I don't want this to happen. I don't need my code yet. 
I could just use an array and I could have the same problems, right? So how do I avoid this? I can avoid it, right? I do not, this does not have to happen anymore. What can I do? Someone who hasn't contributed yet today. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got code right here that's running, right? I know what the value of the index is that you're sending in. Let's just have this return zero for now. Get rid of this. So I know that you're giving me a bad index. So what can I do about it? So I can say if index is less than zero, then I can't return the value in the array. What should I return instead? Return like, I don't know. There, this, this is one of those places where there's not really a right answer here. I'll return negative one. Okay. So now, if you give me bogus negative indices, I'm good. What about, okay, is this perfectly safe yet? What about if I do 10? Ah, okay. So now I've got a problem on the other side of the array, because I'm only checking to see if it's less than zero. What I really need to do is say if it's greater than or equal to, um, the size of my array. I get this bad value. And you know what? Let's put that print statement in here as well. So now at least know that something bad happened. Okay. All right, so this is kind of cool, I guess. I have like a safer array, except there's one problem here. What's wrong with my, what's wrong with this code? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not very useful yet. What, what would I like to be able to do? So far, I have a function that will return zeros. Not very exciting. What do I need to be able to do? Creating my storage class. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be able to set values in the array. So, let's write a setter. Okay. So my code is gonna be very similar. I'm gonna set set index, but I also need to take a value. Let's, let's explicitly mark these as public, too. All right. So my set code looks a lot like my get code. Checks the index. Now there's a problem here, which is that I don't wanna return negative one, because this is a void function, so I'll just return. So I check the value to make sure that you're not giving me a bogus value. Um, check the index. If you're not giving me a bad index, then we're good. So let's try this. First dot set, three, two, 25, and then let's grab that value. Okay, good. I liked, Let's, uh, just, just for fun, just quickly before I move on, I liked that idea earlier about, uh, the other constructor. That was kind of exciting. Let's do that. All right. Um, so let's create a constructor that allows me to, 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 uh, provide an array. Now, I could just say this, and that would work. The problem is, and this is gonna make more sense to you when we talk about object references, uh, in a, in a week or two. The problem is, at this point, my array and the array that was passed in would be sharing the same content, and I don't really want that. Instead, what I wanna do is copy the array. So let's do that instead. So let's say our storage array is equal to a new array that's the size of whatever 
you provide me. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through the array that you passed me, and I'm going to say storage i is equal to values i. So this is just an array copy. I create, I initialize my array to be the same size as the one you gave me on line 12, and then the loop that starts on line 13 just goes through all the values and, and prints them off. And let's make sure that this works. So we'll do new int one, two, five, and then I need to change these to two. Oh yeah, Jaxdal doesn't like this. Here we go. Okay. So now I can initialize this uh, with an array as well. Cool. Any questions about this? It's kind of fun. So this is, you know, I wouldn't say this is a canonical example of a setter and getter, because I'm actually setting and getting an array rather than a uh, value on the class, right? So let's actually, let's do this, um, let's do this quickly. Let's do another example. So let's do a person example. Let me get rid of this code, and I'll just show you, I'm just gonna show you a, a really fast example of kind of a canonical way to set up a class like this. And then I have a public string get name return name. Okay. All right. So now I can say you dot get name. There you go. But there is no way to set the value of your name after you've been created. Yeah, it's private access. So this is an example of creating a read-only variable by not providing a setter. If I wanted to allow you to set the name, I create my method that returns void. It's called set name. It takes Right? And now I have to use that function to set the name. There you go. All right, questions about setters or getters? Okay, and actually, let's do another, let's do this here. I wanna drive something home here before we go on. So one really important concept with objects that's difficult to wrap your head around when you get started is that every object has its own state. And then let's print another at the bottom. All right, cool. So what happened here? I created a person a person object on line 15, I initialized it with one name, I created a person object on line 16, I initialized it with another name, then I modified the name of the first person I created, a variable called you. When I got to the bottom, I printed both you.name and another.name, and another.name did not change. That's because that's a separate object that has its own name. Okay, I think I just did something very similar to this. Any questions on access modifiers or setters or getters before I start the process of confusing you 10 minutes before the weekend? All right, this is all making sense? I hope, yes. Can a class be private? That's a great question, okay. Can a class be private? The answer is no. An outer, so we'll talk more about this later. Um, what we've been working with so far, just a very small digression, is something called an outer class. An outer class is not inside of another class. Outer classes have to be public. I can create, in Java, 
something called an inner class. We'll come back and talk about this later. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, to scare you guys before the weekend. That'll work. That's valid Java code. The classes that I stick inside my classes can be private. The outer classes themselves cannot. Any questions? All right. So, let's talk about, oops, sorry, right here. The ones that are inside can be either private or public. Again, we'll come back and talk about that. I don't want to go too far into outer classes. Okay. So, in our game of Java keyword bingo, you can now cross off static. We're gonna talk about another keyword in Java. And again, I bring this up with a fair amount of trepidation, and we will talk about it more on Monday. Because static, I feel like, causes more confusion than any other concept in the object-oriented programming part of this course. Okay. So, when you mark something as static, Methods can be marked as static. Variables can be marked as static. What does that mean? Up until this point, the variables and the methods that we've been working with, the variables, for example. So if I look, if I go back and I look at this example that I did, both you and another both had their own name. They have separate name variables that are stored separately, they're accessed separately, they're modified separately. Once I stick static on something, that variable or that method no longer belongs to an object. Instead, it belongs to the class, okay? What does that mean? So, a instance variable, so, so what does this mean from a practical perspective, okay? So, for example, we have some, we have some new syntax to think about, right? So here, I have marked the method print name static. Up until this point, I could not call an instance method if I didn't have an instance of that class. You need an instance of the class in order to call the method. Now, I'm relaxing that restriction, right? Now, as long as I have the class, I can call the method. So this will actually work. I can call this method by using the name of the class followed by the name of the method, something I can do only for static methods. I can also call that method if I have an instance of the object. So for example, now on line 11, I've created a new instance of type course, class course. I can also call a static method with an instance. But I don't need an instance, okay? Up until this point, there was no way to do this. If you try to call an instance method without an instance of the object, it fails. That's why it's called an instance method. A class method or a static method can be called only by using the class, right? So a static method can be called directly on the class. And it can also be called on an instance. Now here's something that's important about this particular uh, type of method. Because it can be called without an instance of the class, it can't use the this keyword. Remember this? This refers to an instance of the class that's running the method. But with a static method, there's no instance of the class. Not necessarily. So for example, here I have an instance variable. Again, I know we're almost done, and we'll come back to this on Monday, but I really want you guys to, to, to look at this and think about it over the weekend, because this is, Confusing. One of the reasons why it's so confusing, just as a brief aside, is that static is one thing in Java that makes a huge difference to how things work. It's a small keyword, it's only, you know, six letters or whatever, but if you put it in the wrong spot, everything will stop working. And then if you get rid of it, everything will start working. Okay, so I have an instance variable. If I don't use static, that variable, every instance of the object, every instance of the class has its own copy of that variable. So every course has a name. My method is static, so there's only one copy of it, and I can run it on the class. But I can't access the name as part of the method because the name is part of an instance. 
and I couldn't use this dot name either. Static variables. So again, I can have a static method. Static methods are typically the most useful, but I also, I'm gonna show you that I can have a static variable. When I have a static variable, every instance of the class shares that variable. So any changes that they make are visible to all the other instances, and I can also access it without an instance of the class. So here I create two courses, and then I increment the counter course dot count, which I can access using the course, um, class because it's a static variable. Then at the bottom, I print count. Both of these can access this variable, and both of those statements are going to print one. Okay, so let me prove this to you, all right? Um, good. All right? So again, here's, here's why this is confusing. Well, first of all, this won't even work, right? Because now, if I change it from static to non-static, I can't access it that way on line 15. But let's imagine that I'm using this to track, like someone suggested before, how many course instances have been created. So that's kinda nice. Every time I call the constructor, I increment this counter. But again, the counter is shared by every instance of course. So again, here's one of these places where if I take that off, it doesn't work anymore. Because now it's an instance variable, and I've increased it from zero to one. If I put static back here, it's a class variable, and now let me make sure that this is really explicit. We'll put another print statement in here. We'll get rid of this one. So now, after I create one course, the value of count is one. After I create two courses, its value is two. All right, we will pick up here on Monday. I hope, um, that I've confused you just enough for you to enjoy the weekend. Um, so one quick announcement. Some of you have wanted to do this, like, interview for an LAS class or something like that. Um, I'm doing, gonna do those once today at 2 p.m. in my office as part of my office hours. So if you wanna do one, show up. Uh, if you don't, you're not there at 2, I'm not gonna do them again. They get repetitive. Have a great weekend. I will see you guys on Monday.